Thank you for joining us for this Facebook live broadcast coming to you from the JSE Limited, the heart of business in Santon, Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm joined by Alec Hogg, who is the editor of Biz News. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen, editor-in-chief of CNBC Africa. And we are here to unpack the World Economic Forum annual meeting 2017, which took place at the end of, end of January uh, in Davos, Switzerland. I'm already losing my voice, but Alec, let's jump into this exclusive event. 3,000 delegates from all over the world meet up in Davos, which on my first occasion was quite an interesting venue because you are knee deep in snow and you certainly can't escape. And I think that's actually mm. the whole purpose. You are a 13 time veteran of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Now, nobody can actually match that stat. I think everybody in this room knows Alec Hogg. If you don't know him, then you certainly haven't been in the business circles in the South African environment because you are a renowned South African business journalist. However, he is now taking Biz News Global. And uh, I don't want to talk about your list of accolades and awards, and everybody knows that. So tell me about Davos 2017, yeah. and specifically Team South Africa. Yeah, Bron, it's, a, it's a, uh, my very first time that I went there was in 1993. It was out of the blue, and uh, we got an invitation from Klaus Schwab, who is the, uh, the founder of this thing called the World Economic Forum. And he decided on Davos because it was cheap 46 years ago. Well, today, the little town is not cheap at all, as uh, we can tell you that they generate about 80% of the revenue at a ski resort in the one week. Because those 3,000 people that Bronwyn mentioned come from primarily from business. Uh, they pay 500,000 Rand for a ticket to get in. We don't. We, we, we work, work. <laughs> um, well, and we do actually work. Well, sorry, you Maybe work. you don't work, but I do work. <laughs> yeah. no, she, no, Bronwyn works very hard there. Uh, I kind of flit around and interview a few interesting people. So I have fun. But those, so you have, up until last year, there were 2,600 people that used to go. And for this, some reason, they jacked it up to 3,000. And you could feel it. You could feel that the place was a bit, a bit bigger than in, in the past. But this group of people that come together are CEOs or chairmen of uh, major global companies and, of course, heads of state, Nobel Prize winners. It really is a, a, an, an accumulation of lots of brain power. People you haven't like mentioned them. Shakira, you haven't mentioned Matt Damon, <laughs> yeah. Forrest Whitaker. Obviously, the movie stars sure. don't impress you or the pop stars. Well, Shakira does. Not so sure. <laughs> but, but they, at this, and the way it all gets put together, they've got about 200 bright young things from top universities in the world. And they, they go out during those, uh, in between the World Economic Forum events, where there are regional events. The, the Bronwyn's very involved. Uh, CNBC Africa is the host broadcaster at the Africa Forum, which this year is going to Durban for the it's first time. It's going to be time. in Durban from the 3rd mm. to the 5th of May. And uh, again, that is, a, as you say, a regional mm. event. We'll have heads of state from across the African continent. And then again, the business uh, representatives from across Africa. So those 200 bright young things go off, go and see what are the trends around the world. They bring the trends together, put them on the agenda, and the 3,000 heavy hitters come and learn because most of the time they're teaching others. They absorb over five days, go back home, and you actually know pretty well what's going to happen in the world for the next year because if you watch what's happening in Davos, the, the power nexus of the world, when they go home, they then apply those different learnings and changes. And I've, I've noticed over the, the time I've been going there, I went in 93 for the first time, didn't go for many years, and then went again, I think it was 2003, uh, where I was invited back and I've been continuously going since. And the trends are what's important. In so let, let's talk about the trend, and, and specifically let's start with Team South Africa. There are a couple of, mm -hmm. of different themes that we're going to cover during this session. Certainly we're going to talk about the changing global order. We'll talk about the fourth industrial revolution, about inclusive growth, and also about this new term blockchain. But I want to start with Team South Africa. This was my sixth event, and generally it has been led by President Jacob Zuma. What changed for Team South Africa this this time around was that we were led by South African Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa. Take it away. 
Well, uh, you'll recall that uh, on the Friday before everybody goes, the following week, um, up to that point, Zuma was going. And then there was a shift. And what they did, the WEF people did, was they got Ramaphosa onto a lot of different platforms in Davos. So they exposed him very aggressively. He was, uh, he brought a completely new light to the South African delegation. Cyril, he, he's an intellectual, he reads a lot, uh, he just gets the way people talk in, uh, in the, if you like, at, at, at the most powerful four in the world, and he holds his own and delivers, um, well, a presidential presence. And it I, was, if it I was can great. Add, I mean, I, I just loved it this year as a consequence of that. With the deputy president, CNBC Africa hosts uh, the only Africa-focused debate in the Congress Center, and we broadcast that live to 48 countries across Africa. And I had the pleasure of having Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa on that panel with different presidents. And Ali Kodankote, as you'll know, the richest man in Africa, was on that panel. And just to reiterate what you're saying, he really held his own. And in fact, it, I was very proud to be South African. It reminded me of 93. I mean, we're going back a long time before democracy. In 1993, the, the group of people who were there and the reason we were invited, incidentally, was because in 1992, de, Co uh, de Klerk um, and Bortolesi met on a public platform for the first time with Nelson Mandela in Davos. Mandela went to Davos, a communist, let's nationalize everything. He came back believing in the free market. That's the power of this place. But what I recall about 93 was Tito Mboweni was Tito. He wasn't Mr. Governor. Trevor Manuel was Trevor, not Mr. Manuel, the finance minister. And it was an informality, a, 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 congeni a collegiality, I, I think you could say, um, of the South African delegation back then that we can do anything if we pull together. And I felt that again this year. In the interceding, apart from 2010, when the FIFA World Cup came to South Africa, and that was, there was a bit of upliftment in the South African delegations. Apart from 2010, I haven't seen this. I yet. think that there's just one more thing that I do want to add, having been part of the African delegation, and it's not just a South African delegation. We have got representatives from Nigeria, from Rwanda, from Kenya, um, and, and really there is a brand Africa forming at the World Economic Forum, particularly in Davos. Generally, there was less interest in Africa, and that's including South Africa, simply because the global environment is so volatile at the moment. So we were really quite insignificant. It was quite sad that we had our act together, but people weren't too interested in hearing our story. That would be my sense. You may feel differently. Uh, I, I agree. I, in, in the last 13 years that I've consecutively been going there, uh, initially Africa was nowhere. And then Africa was the bell of the ball. You couldn't get in. It, you'd have a session, say, in a room like this with people queuing for literally 50, 60 meters outside the door, trying to get in this new Africa story investment in Africa. But we must never forget that Africa's uh, hard currency revenues, 60% are generated by oil. 60%. We think we come from a country with no oil, but with uh, uh, minerals, and the minerals are about 10 to 15%. So it's really an oil story. So when the oil price was rising up towards 100 or even $120 a barrel, Africa was incredible. Oh, and the growth appealing. rates were amazing. Well, I mean, you know, economies were it. hitting 7, 8, 9 percent. <laughs> we had 8 percent, 8.5 percent in this country back in 1981 after the gold price hit $850 an ounce in 1980, if you recall. So you throw money at something, it doesn't matter how badly it was managed, and we weren't terribly well managed back then, um, you will grow. And that's been the problem. So the, 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 the opportunity was missed in many respects. And Africa is now off the agenda, as you say. You could easily walk into any Africa-related session. There were lots of empty seats. So the changing global order. And uh, I think let's start with Trump. First of all, yeah. on CNBC Africa Global, we've coined Trump onomics because really it's volatile out there. And he's running the US, as we all know, on Twitter, which is interesting because there's huge <laughs> visibility. At least we can say a lot for transparency. What was interesting about the timing of the World Economic Forum uh, this time around was that the inauguration of Trump was happening on the Friday. And we started, things started heating up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not much. I don't know what, what your sense was, but I, I think people were really nervous to get caught on the wrong side 
of Trump ahead of the inauguration. There were many, I didn't find many opinions being expressed about the president-elect at that time. I think, Bron, the, the, the feeling, and we, we took the same view at Biz News, was give him the benefit of the doubt. We did the same with Zuma, exactly the same thing. And I can remember at the time, some people who had a, a deeper understanding of it, being highly critical of the line that we took. With Trump, it was the same thing. Uh, many people that were, were better informed said, why are you giving this idiot the benefit of the doubt? But that's what you try to do in the work that we do. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> there's no more doubt, and there sure ain't been any benefit from Mr. Trump so far. He blew it almost day one um, when he came out with an executive order. And I remember it took Obama six years to do a single executive order. Trump did 18 in his first 10 days. And the executive orders that he did were all related to campaign promises. Now, campaign promises often are done on the fly. Somebody in the audience asks a silly question, um, how are you going to stop the Mexicans from coming in? And he can sense the audience. He says, we're going to build a wall. Well, he's going to build a wall. So he's, 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 he's got this businessman approach towards governance. And the business approach is, my word is my bond. If I tell you something, I'm going to do it, even if I'm going to lose money on it. And that seems to be what Donald Trump has, has uh, unfortunately visited upon America. A very impressive man was outgoing U.S. Pre Vice President Joe Biden. Mm, yeah. Tell us a bit. Of, you attended that session. I did. I, 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 I was uh, very impressed with Biden last year. He did the closing address, I think, last year in Davos. And he was extremely presidential. And you, you, you sat there looking at this guy, and he calls himself... I think average Joe Biden, because he's like the normal guy in the street. And he really does come across that way. And you wondered, now, why was Biden not in the presidential race? I suppose at the time, I didn't pay enough attention, but he looked like a wonderful candidate. Um, yet, and usually the vice president of the United States is a candidate. Uh, there's, there's the, the feedback I got was that there were personal issues that he decided not to do it. But had he become the US president, well, things would be a little different, I guess. So while the U.S. was absent and they were waiting for their inauguration, and of course you, you did have some representation, and we've just discussed the outgoing vice president, President Xi of China swooped in and basically garnered all the attention. He did. He was the star of the show. He had, however, the WEF guys tell me, 250 hangers on. Now, you know how tight that place is for accommodation. President Xi's 1.3 billion people, I guess, you know, 250 guys follow the president around. What should we be worrying about these blue light brigades and you know, whatever? Um, can you imagine his blue light brigade? But he was, he was most definitely. He stood up there. He got a, a, a standing ovation from the Davos faithful because he, like Davos, is standing for global cooperation. I mean, the irony of it. Here you have the leader of the Communist Party, the last real successful communist in the world, who is standing up for free trade and free enterprise. Uh, and then you get the bastion of free enterprise who is standing for corru uh, I don't ooh, corruption. Ooh. <laughs> they, no, no, no. Please take that back. We are live on Facebook right now. Protectionism. There's, there's, uh, it, it really is the other way around. And the interesting point on this, I, I've had a, a fascinating expose, exposure to uh, the CEO of a company called Eurasia. Now, Eurasia is one of those... Um, uh, deep consultancies who go behind the scenes and get to know people and, and then they get paid a lot of money to tell business people and others what's actually going on in the world. And he was saying, Ian Bremer was saying that the week before, this is last week in Cape Town, the week before he was with Jason Kushner. Jason Kushner is Trump's son-in-law. Uh, he is suggested by people that together with that guy from Breitbart that he actually runs the country. Um, Kushner was telling Ian Bremer, Trump's view of the world. And I found this fascinating. Conservatives, you will find, often read history. And particularly in the United States, they are well read. These are not dumb people. These are intelligent people. But it's the interpretation of history that starts going a little bit all right. His interpretation is that, or the Trump administration's interpretation, according to Kushner, is that every time in history where you had a leading power that is on the decline, i.e. United States, and a ascending power that's on the ascension, i.e. China, there is always a massive confrontation between the two. 
in 12 of the last 14 times that this happened in history over 200 years, I guess, that has happened. So the thinking in the White House is let's hit them while they're still weak. Reality. How do we hit them while they're weak? Well, of course, through a trade war. What is a trade war? Very simple. You just jack up the prices on imports from that country. Now, we've seen this being triggered in two ways already. On day one of Trump's new, day, new uh, position, the day he moved into the White House, he had an executive order to tear up the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Treaty. This is his friends or people who were distrusted China, like Vietnam, who are now thrown into the Chinese camp, Australia, Japan, China, of course, itself, all the Pacific countries who'd sat together for many years to, to, to craft this agreement, which Trump tore up on day one. The implications of that kind of a, a decision are significant. The other thing, getting back to Davos, I'm Anthony glad you, you're getting back to Davos. You're going to get caught up in the White House. Anthony Scaramucci was the only representative from the Trump administration in Davos this year. So he was very popular. His major contribution to all the discussions, we will win a trade war against China. Extraordinary. Extraordinary times we're going into. Extraordinary times. And then, of course, Brexit and Theresa May. Now, you're a Theresa May fan. And you are now based in the United Kingdom. So talk to us. Theresa May is a... Uh, um, is very different to uh, to the Eaton Boys, who used to run uh, the UK. Uh, she's she's the daughter of a, a, a priest. Of, well, not a priest because it isn't the Catholic Church, but uh, a vicar. So she comes from almost like a Maggie Thatcher kind of person, very middle middle of the road, but very bright. And she's a great. She's achieved an enormous amount. Has no children, so she's dedicated her life and her husband, who was a a president of the Oxford Union, dedicated their lives to politics. She is someone that you need to read her, her um, speeches, uh, a very um, articulate, a very deep thinking person who believes that there is almost a middle way. She has the advantage of running a country with a, a very old democracy. Often in our country here in South Africa, we forget we're a very young democracy. We've got to learn things. And what she's doing and what she told people in Davos was that as we have this relationship with America that goes back to the First and Second World Wars, but actually we side with China. We side with, with anti-protectionism, with mercantilism, with free trade. So the world is breaking up into these two blocks. Yes, but, and those but now remember, she actually mm -hmm. came into the Davos environment with many, many people negative about Brexit. Sure. So she had to navigate that, and you, you say she's anti-protectionist, yeah. and that doesn't really marry up with the kind of going the Brexit route. Although she didn't choose, she just got executed. She she was uh, she was very quiet in Brexit. If anything, she was she was a Remainer. Um, but she's now inherited what she's inherited, and being in a, a, an old democracy, the will of the people, 52 to 48, is the will of the people. There was a, there's a mandate, the referendum is over, and Brexit is going ahead. What, what people outside of the UK don't really often get about Brexit is because the, the way the media has positioned this, it's all been done on an anti-immigration ticket because of UKIP and Nigel Farage's crazy antics. We all watch him because he's quite funny. I mean, people do watch funny people on YouTube. But it's more a question here that the UK had almost two groups. You had the crazies, the loony right, but there's a very strong free market uh, run, well, led by the likes of Daniel Hannan, who, if you want to go and look on YouTube, go and watch this guy. It's sovereignty. Uh, he, I was interviewing a, a chap called Daniel uh, Brock Brocklebank from Orbis, the UK operation of Alan Gray, and he said the last eight major decisions by, taken by the UK courts were overturned by the European courts. So, oh, what happens to your sovereignty if your courts can't make laws anymore? The, the way that Britain wants to go forward into the future is to make itself attractive for foreign investment, but the EU says those are the, invest, those are the tax rates that you can offer to business, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's the sovereignty, the free market, the mercantilism grouping, on the one hand, who voted uh, to get out of EU, 
the other hand you had the crazies and then the British people the British people do not ever underestimate democracy and the, the, the understanding particularly of an electorate like that highly educated very very uh, with it with uh, current affairs and relationships they also primarily went against it so Brexit don't think Brexit's a bad thing I'm actually very much siding towards the the Brexit future for Britain because if you take a a fourth industrial revolution uh, society what do you need you need education you need enter, uh, enterprising society and you need to have the ability to make your land or your country attractive for skilled labor for skilled people to come to it brexit gives britain that opportunity within the eu it didn't have it so let's move on now we're 30 minutes into this discussion and we're going to open up to audience questions but before we get there and and this is a, a sense on timing we have still got to talk about the fourth industrial revolution inclusive growth and blockchain because blockchain i don't know whether you're encountering it left right and center i'm sure everybody wants to hear about that buzzword so actually i'm going to turn things on its head and i'm going to go to blockchain right sure. now please take us through from a layperson's stance what is blockchain and is it something like y2k that we can actually just ignore or is it as big as the internet well you you, you might recall i started money web in 1997 it was a, a early days of the internet in south africa the internet started in 1992 so 1996 is four years into the internet and i hadn't even certainly here i hadn't really known what this interweb what what was but uh I did see that there was some kind of potential. By 97, we'd started uh, MoneyWeb. In 99, we listed it on the stock market two years later at a forward PE of over 100. What that means is the profits we were going to make the next year, we had investors just wanting desperately to get our shares at 100 times this year's profits. That was what the internet was. Blockchain today, according to the guys in California and a few of the people that I engaged with, is where the internet was in 1996. So it's right on the cusp. Uh, I spoke to, I had quite a lot of discussions with a guy called Jeff Schumacher. Uh, he is a, a investor in blockchain in particular with a, a large venture capital fund in California. He was invited by the World Economic Forum to talk to people about blockchain. And uh, he said this year we're on the agenda, which is quite a big thing because it's, it's a start of it. Next year he claims we will dominate the agenda. What is blockchain? Blockchain gives you uh, uh, identity. It's every, every person and every asset is identifiable online. Now, that doesn't sound so clever until you start thinking, well, it means that, Bronwyn, you and I, you might have one share in NASPERS, and I want to buy that share in NASPERS, and you want to sell it. Well, if it's easily identifiable, we can transact without having to go through anything else i.e. no stock exchange, no straight, no, no uh, other structures that at the moment in, intermediate so much of what happens starting in the financial world. The implication for banks is massive. The implications for things like uh, estate agents, um, for, for anything that is intermediary between an asset and an individual. Because the problem we have at the moment, how can I trust you actually have that NASPERS share? How can I trust the guy who wants to buy my house is actually going to pay for it? Well, on blockchain, it's all there. All the information's there. Your credit record's there. Your, your, and your, your asset base is there. And that is revolutionizing and will revolutionize the world. It's upon us. It's not well, something for tomorrow? It's like the internet in 96. When, when, in fact, I learned about the internet in 1995. In 1995, I was working at ABSA. One of my colleagues, ABSA at the time, was a big client of IBM. Uh, Alvain Berger went to, uh, um, the, uh, to IBM's um, head office, came back and said to me, gee, Alec, you'll be interested in this. Come and look at this thing, this interweb thing, um, internet. I just called it the interweb because I didn't really understand it. And that was where I understood. So someone like me had understood it, but it took me two years to start MoneyWeb or start a publishing company online, then it, it, it just took off. If you recall Mark Shuttleworth, he made uh, $700 million. He was trying to flog the business that he started here in South Africa for $30 million. And no one in South Africa had really got it. So a company called Verisign 
bought it, but the share prices were going like this on NASDAQ, that he smartly said, well, don't pay me the $30 million, give me shares. So he got, I think it was 2.2 million very signed shares. By the time he got to selling those shares, it was worth $700 million. That is what happened in the NASDAQ bubble. Who knows if there's going to be a blockchain bubble, but the one thing we need to do, if we could go back to 96, we would have learned about the internet. We need, to, we're in 96 as per blockchain. So, so really don't ignore blockchain and, and make sure that you understand the application or the potential application for your businesses. Are there any questions at this point from the audience before we move on from, from blockchain? I don't want to go back to the politics because we could stay there all day. How big uh, an effect did Russia have on the American elections? How can they quantify it? So the question for our audience, how big effect did Russia have on the American elections? Let's just go back to, I, I want to try and, and move from politics, mm. but do you have an answer there? Uh, it's, at the moment, um, it's outside my circle of competence, but what I can tell you, uh, was that the whole North Korean hacking is of major importance around the world, and not just North Korean hacking. If you remember, before North Korea, it was China's hacking. So we have China hacking, North Korea hacking, Russians hacking, internet security, cyber security is a big story. It's a very, very Huge in business. In it's Davos. something that, that we are very naive because in South Africa, we haven't really got hurt yet, but it's something that needs to be, we need to pay a lot of attention because the, if governments can get hacked, you can imagine what they could do to little, little businesses, let alone big businesses. Has anyone quantified? It's in, it's, it's in process. It's all in process at the moment. So, you know, the, 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 the well, I mean, the America, Trump appointed a, a, secret, a security secretary and then he had to uh, get rid of him. That's mm. unprecedented as well. So when I think they get everything about Trump right now is unprecedented. So we are going to be living in a very volatile environment. And but what I can say is Bronwyn will get an interview much quicker than I will. I, I'm not sure how exactly to take that. I think we'll, we'll move on very swiftly. There was another theme. Sorry, let me open up more further questions in the room. Just another theme that we do want to touch on, and we haven't alluded to it, is climate change was very big at the, the World Economic Forum. And in fact, President Xi weighed in on this discussion. Just a couple of stats out there is that 4,000 people on a daily basis die of air pollution in China every day. So there's a big move by the World Economic Forum, and I was involved in a lot of these carbon credits, uh, markets being established, et cetera, those kinds of debates. But there's a huge global attempt to limit the earth warming another two degrees Celsius, because what it does mean is that London will be underwater, Florida will be underwater. You won't believe the displacement. Bangladesh, 40 to 50 million people will be displaced. So think about the refugee crisis that we're experiencing and what, we, what that means if you've got 40 to 50 million people being displaced simply because of climate change. Anyway, that was one of my hobby horses at the, the World Economic Forum. Your question, sir. Hi. My question is quite simple, and it relates to job creation in general. We all know that that is paramount to our safe future. In the past, there has been a very definite emphasis on agriculture and tourism to create what they term the million jobs by 2020. And I'd like to know from you, being involved with the Africa Desk, whether the emphasis has now changed since this fund headed up by Alan Kosef. So let me just give a very brief comment on that. Agriculture has been at the forefront of many, many discussions, and particularly in the World Economic Forum Africa, as it uh, comes about in, in May. And I've never seen, I'm a farmer's daughter, so I understand the supply chain quite intimately from an agricultural perspective. There's a lot of talk about agriculture and the fact that this is the lifeblood of the African continent, not just South Africa but I don't see that actually being commercialized. There is a spin-off of the World Economic Forum called Grow Africa. That's how important this conversation is, and that is a, a global forum as well. It's focused specifically on agriculture, and they now are targeting execution in the supply chain. So hopefully we'll be able to feed back from that forum. It takes a, a lot of um, working to get stakeholders together across the, the agricultural supply chain, 
and, and presidents in Africa have to take this seriously because we have 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. We can be the bread basket of the world. The world needs to be fed. It is low hanging fruit, but is it translating? I haven't seen it yet. And I've been involved in a lot of those conversations. Right, inclusive growth, because I think that follows on the job creation, inclusive growth. This is a theme that not only South Africa or Africa is battling with, it is the whole world. Well, it, it, it's being highlighted by people like Oxfam with the figures that they uh, like to throw out on the difference between the rich and the poor. Um, and the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Now, where do you lay the blame? The blame that people like Oxfam are saying is that the rich shouldn't have this intergenerational wealth. So there should be more estate duties. Warren Buffett, by the way, also agrees with that approach. Whereas the, the, the perhaps another uh, way of looking at it is that the, uh, those people who've got super rich like that have actually given the world some incredible things. Facebook, uh, Buffett, the investments he's made have been incredible. He's a self-made man. Of course, Bill Gates, were it not for the Gates Foundation, we would still have polio in Africa. Only the Gates Foundation has eliminated it. So it's a, it's a debate that's going on, but there's, there's a very interesting debate that's going on right now about the myths. Humanity has been given myths over many ages. For instance, different racial groups are different, have different intellectual capabilities, which is total bullshit because the biologists have proved that we are all exactly the same. We just happen to have maybe lighter or darker skin because of our existence that might have been in the past. So now the, 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 those who like to perpetrate this view are talking about, well, then it's culture, which is also nonsense. Because if you put two people into a room and allow them to engage with each other, they will find common ground. It's, there's, there's interesting stuff happening in the world. The world is changing. People are changing. People are not believing the myths anymore. They're not believing the garbage that's been thrown at them by politicians, people who, others who are seeking power, businesses who are seeking, wanting you to believe their story so that you give them the money that they can live better. The myths are coming under enormous scrutiny. And that's where the world, why the world is changing. EU, European Union started off, getting back to Brexit, as a free trade area. Well and good. But the bureaucrats in Brussels wanted to be a United States of Europe. That's what they're after. And had that been sold to the Greeks, the Italians, the French, the, the, the British up front, they would never have bought into it. So it's these, and now, so the British are pulling out. The, the Five Star Movement in Italy, if you've been following there, there's a guy who was a, like a Zapiro, a comedian, stand-up comedian, who's now likely to be the next president of Italy. Why? Because he said to the Italian people, we've been sold a lie over here. Marine Le Pen in, in France, the Netherlands. There's this massive kickback because people will go with a Trump rather than the status quo. And those are the issues that the world is now having to deal with because a Trump is not necessarily better, better than the it's status quo. It's just different. And it's populism that is coming to the fore. And the French election, I think, is going to be a pivotal point. Obviously, Italy. Indeed. But if Marine Le Pen comes in, you know, by all accounts, it may not be easy for her to execute, as we were discussing earlier, but she is set, it appears, to, to pull France out of the European Union as well. So you're basically going to see the, the whole institution That's falling the apart. Let's just see if there are any questions uh, from our Facebook audience. Not at this stage. Do we have any additional? Yes. Um, can you say, though, that if uh, Le Pen did get in, that that in itself would end the EU then and there? Not at all. The, the, Le Pen does not have at her power the ability to pull France out of, the, out of the EU. But what she can do is make the EU even more ungovernable. And that's really the strategy. The strategy won't be... She doesn't have the, the ability to call a referendum to leave the EU. It's, it's because it's part of the EU constitution. Remember, they were one of the first people who started. They started the euro, etc. What she can do, though, is make it impossible for the EU to function. And that's the strategy of hers. She's not a shoe in In fact, she's only number two now in the, in the likelihood. She could win the first round. But the second round is... Are the pollsters telling you that? Oh, who knows what the pollsters no, are? No, well, I'm making a facetious joke there because we must just no. go the other way. You know, you know, Donald Trump was 50 to 1 huh? yeah. 
two years ago. 50 to 1. He was, I remember when there was a horse called Power King, was it, who won the July at 25 to 1. Donald Trump was a better, better bet than Power King at 25 to 1 at that and, stage. And on Trump, his promise is to create more jobs. So let's assume they leave China or that region and do go back and open up the factories. Forgetting the fact that you'd want those factories to be automated, how on earth would they sell their product globally with the, the cost of manufacturing uh, in America? It's, it's, it's a rhetorical question. Uh, I think we, we all just ask that. Donald Trump is making lots of, lots of noises. He's making lots of uh, uh, promises. He's making lots of policies that the American system, because of its checks and balances, will block. It's not a system like in South Africa, where you have a leader of a political party who actually, because of the structure, we, we put a president there because we thought they were all going to be Nelson Mandela. So we've got a, we got a problem. We've got to fix that thing. In the U.S., they don't, they don't have that problem. They have got hundreds of years of democracy. They have checks and balances in the system, and you're already seeing it come back. So don't get too alarmed. He cannot change the world on his own. He can make lots of trouble, but there is still a system where people can block it, and they are. And they, remember with the, uh, the immigrants, he had an executive order. Well, sorry, if you come from one of these seven countries, you can't come in. How in idiotic is that? You have students, you have executives, you have, you have tax-paying Americans. He says, as an executive order, and the first judge said, I won't, and he fires her. The next judge says, sorry, you can't fire me as well. And they stopped it, and it blocked it. So Trump's going to try lots of things, um, as he's already shown us, but it doesn't mean with an old democracy like that that those checks and balances won't kick in, and they are kicking in. Don't be too depressed. Yes. <laughs> It is. Hang on. I do need it for the Facebook audience. Thank you so much. If you can just speak directly into it. Um, how much do they chat at Davos about the whole robotics side of the future? Because from my perspective, we have all this unemployment issue throughout the world. And if you look at robotics, it's also very real. And, and for me, it's a huge danger. And I don't see how we will ever solve the unemployment crisis anywhere in the world with the, the rise of robotics the way it's going. So just to comment from my side, robotics huge, artificial intelligence a huge theme, so many sessions, and where Africa used to be on the global stage, those AI sessions packed to the broom with people trying to understand. Just a, a very small anecdote before I hand over to Alec, in the, the forum, so you have all the plenary sessions and all the rooms, they had a, a AI psychiatrist that you could put headphones on and he, it could actually assess your state of mind and understand why you weren't in a relationship, etc., etc. I mean, it really is a very, very different environment when it comes to AI. Uh, about three years ago, again, this is where Davos's real strength is, is it actually picks up the trends. About three years ago, there's a, a, a guy called uh, Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson wrote a book uh, which they called the, the Second Industrial Age. And that was picked up by the Davos team. And I got very lucky. Thomas Friedman, who wrote The, the, the World is Flat, um, invited, I was around, so I got invited to, to a breakfast with these guys. That's three oh, years ago. Don't be so humble. No, no. It, it, you get lucky. You know what it's like there, Brian. You just, you get on the right mailing list. I'm on the right mailing list. And uh, this breakfast, and of course, you remember breakfast. Now, tell me, tell you about Davos breakfast. Minus 22 degrees, and you've got to walk for 20 minutes. Mm. So it's not always a, a big advantage, but this was incredible. Because here you had these two groundbreakers, and uh, they were telling us then about how things were going to change. Davos has increasingly put that onto the agenda more and more. And as Bronwyn said, this year, everybody gets it and they're standing room only of the thought leaders of the world. Now you take it into the environment of the rest of us, and the, it's now becoming more and more uh, understood in most parts of the world. I, got, I, I actually got a book that year from Bryn Jolson and gave it to Rob Davies, our Minister of Trade and Industry, who read it and actually emailed me afterwards to say he had read it. So that's good. So it doesn't mean that we aren't aware of these things. We just have maybe different ways of approaching 
these issues. And to the jobs element and whether robotics will displace uh, the jobs which we so desperately need across the world, the huge emphasis is obviously science, technology, engineering and maths, the STEM uh, skills. And that is where we're lacking from a, from a South African perspective and, and certainly from an African perspective. But they talk about jobs or, or skills augmenting the technology so that you're not displacing one with another, but you learn to work with that technology. That's, that's how they're traversing that very, very difficult discussion as to whether we will lose jobs because of robotics. But, but see it in context. For 18 of the last 20 centuries, human beings were self-employed. It's only since the Industrial Revolution that we've decided that somebody knows better than we know about ourselves. Now, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been self-employed pretty much my whole career. I can't understand how people can go to work every day and get somebody they hate to tell them something, to do something that they know is wrong. And continuously you get this situation because of the hierarchical structure. And I think many people here are entrepreneurs as well. The, 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 third, the, the, the fourth industrial age is actually forcing us back into that reality, into the reality of why... There's a wonderful book that I'd like to recommend. If you haven't read it, it's called Sapiens by um, uh, Yuraf Noah Harari. You can remember Harari. It's not Harari like Zim, but Harari with an I. Read that book. It'll uncover, it'll take away, it certainly lifted the scales from my eyes on so many of the myths that we grow up with, that we believe are true. But when you interrogate them, you discover that Pretoria doesn't know better than we know about our own lives. The markets don't always know better. Mr. Market, we know he's this, this manic depressive and he pushes things one way and pushes it the other way. But the myth we've been thrown by, uh, by society, says uh, Harari, is that the markets know better and governments and the state knows better. So just hand over to the state, they'll look after you. Hand over to the markets, they'll look after you. When in fact, it's all, all it is is abdicating your normal right. Now, human beings in this age, in the fourth industrial revolution, will go back to that normal situation, like 18 of the last 20 centuries, biggest economy on earth, China, by far. Alec, we're running out of time. We've got one more question here and Facebook Live. Sorry. Okay. Alec, I think my, my, my question relates to the previous one. This is, this is, this, you know, with, with this sort of looking into the future and, and where jobs are going, you mentioned, you know, mass uh, engineering, science. What are the things that we should be doing as a country or what are the other countries gearing themselves up for to ensure that uh, you know, the impact of the two billion jobs that they talk about that's going to become redundant, that you actually on the receiving side, as you say, with you know, working alongside it and, and preparing yourself to, to actually benefit from it. You know? I think often when things change, everything says doom and gloom, but if you actually have the foresight and you buy into the change and you accept it, there's a lot that you could probably do as a country yeah. to prepare yourself. It's not doom and gloom and the country can't prepare you. Each of us are incredibly good at something. That's the way human beings are made. Now, if you can apply your passion into that, you will be productive because you will be able to make a greater contribution. And that's really where this, this, this new world is going to. The world, the world that we know is no longer fit for purpose. The rules-based society is under threat, which is sad because a rules-based society does work. Drive on the right-hand side of the road, not on the pavements. Never got through to the taxi drivers, but you know what I'm getting to. And those, that part of it, the structure, the outline has always worked well. Where it starts going off the rails is when you have a, a system, a hierarchical system, where the guy who puts the money up, who might have inherited it from somebody else, gets to tell other people who understand what's going on in that business what they should be doing. And, and talking about a changing world, are I want to bring in Facebook questions. Can we... Thank you so much. whether we're not looking at or moving towards a decentralized global village where people are looking to take back power from failing governments, therefore grasping at straws like Trump. Christian is spot on and it started, well, it started all over the place, but a very good example is Argentina, which was the first country in the world that had an online party, an online political party, and a political party that said, let's all vote online. Again, getting back to the, the, the thesis of Harari's, which goes back to when we were in caves. He says, 
for most of our existence as human beings, we've relied on our family, our extended family, and our community. It's only the last 200 years that the state has become all-powerful. So, and it hasn't worked. So if something doesn't work, it takes you a long time, but you finally do move back to it. Disruptive change was the ticket on which Donald Trump came to power. It was the same ticket that Barack Obama came to power in, if you re remember. He, he said, yes, we can. Yes, we can what? Yes, we can change. Well, Obama didn't change things. So this time around, the electorate said, this guy can't be much worse. Let's give him a go. Unfortunately, he's, he's more disruptive than common sense. But eventually, that, that, that exactly what Christian's saying is, is the way most people, not most, but many people in the world who think about these things are now acting. Depth and breadth of questions along just hands that I've missed. You're all happy. I've got another question, sir. Final question for the session. I think the biggest time bomb in South Africa, we are ignoring, uh, we're sidestepping. It is violence and, 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 and uh, criminal activities. Uh, talking about Facebook, that's been discussed, and what, what does the World Forum think about what is really happening on ground level in South Africa, farm murders and all of that type of stuff? So I don't think the World Economic Forum touched on South Africa's uh, um, situation from a crime perspective and from a violence perspective, but it goes back to that broader theme of inclusive growth. If you have unequal societies, you will have crime. I don't know if you want to well, add. I, I, you, you'll be, uh, Actually, maybe, maybe there are examples of unequal societies where there isn't crime, and you can you, take you'll us be, forward. You'll be intrigued to know that the head of Transparency International is a South African, Kourbis de Swart. He's been, running, he's been CEO there for 10 years. Transparency International, for those of you who don't know, is actually the corruption uh, monitor for the world. And uh, Kourbis was saying that the kickback now against Transparency International has never been worse, i.e. the corruption people around the world, we'll talk to South Africa in a minute, but the corruption people around the world are getting more aggressive. Russia, start there if you want. You want to, have, you want to read something about what's going on, right? read Bill Browder. Um, and exactly how the emperor of Russia is running that place. What happens to the, the leader of the opposition gets gunned down in broad daylight? You know, interesting stuff is happening in certain parts of the world. <coughs> Corruption in South Africa has, is threatening to become endemic. And I took your question differently. I was looking at the, the crime and the violence aspect, and that's my comment around an inequal society. If you've got 27% unemployment in a country, as we do in South Africa in the formal sector, people need to feed their families. So there are two sides of the coin. We could get into a debate about this, but the violence element, I think that that does come from people not having enough. So it comes back to that redistribution and how we solve a very, very complex equation in South Africa. Thank you so much for your time. Um, what did uh, Suzanne call you? Man, international man of mystery? Uh, that was Austin Powers. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. And to our Facebook Live audience, thank you so much for joining us for this session on Davos Retrospective coming to you from the JSC in the heart of Santon, Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you.